Hi everyone, good morning. Today we are joined by two guests and we're going to be continuing our series around Mental Health Awareness Month. Today we're joined by Dr. Mark Foote, Senior Medical Director of Behavioral Health Services here at Intermountain Healthcare and Rob Westman, Executive Director of NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Today we're going to be discussing the effects of the pandemic and what they've had on mental health as well as what resources are available to those who need them. Mark and Rob, thank you so much for joining us. It's nice to have you this morning. Happy to be here, thank you. Thank you. Of course, so I'd love to start by talking about the overall impact that the pandemic has had on mental health in general. Mark, let's start with you and then Rob, I'll turn some time over to you. Well, thank you. You know, it's really hard to say the, uh, the tremendous impact that the pandemic has had on all of us and our mental health. I mean, first it starts with the physical impact. Many of us have had family or friends who've actually had COVID and, and the serious COVID and we've worried about them and their health. Uh, we've, we know people who have died from the pandemic. Um, we tend to, to see the more of the psychologic effects of the pandemic, which again, can't be overstated. It has changed everything about our lives for well over a year. Uh, it's changed our coping skills and our coping strategies. We used to get out and be with people and do fun things. Um, it's kept us locked in our houses where, where we may have had uh, constructive behaviors or we may have had some destructive behaviors. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, we begin to see the after effects of, of any disaster, which psychologically, that's the, that's the time where we tend to see the biggest effects, where the stress really comes out and the, that letdown phenomenon takes over. So we are awaiting more of a wave of, of uh, psychiatric illness and, and just overall distress that's going to happen as the pandemic wanes. And Rob, from your perspective, what have you seen at NAMI in relationship to the pandemic and mental health? You know, it, it as Dr. Foote talked about, the changes have been tremendous. And when you talk about folks who experience mental health conditions, I think the thing to consider is that when we've had to undergo these changes, we our support systems got shifted entirely. As, as Dr. Foote mentioned, we used to get together, we used to meet, we would talk to people. And then we were faced with a situation where we didn't have access to those individuals, at least in the way we were used to. Um, importantly also is we, we faced this limited access to professional care. You know, our therapists were harder to get a hold of, et cetera, et cetera. And I can say for NAMI, we had to shift very quickly from in-person support groups to a virtual support group, which was just, it was a big shift for people. So I, I think the underlying thing is just this theme of change. And I don't know anyone that really likes change. And so that's been a huge factor over the last year. And a year later, I think we're all still learning how to be virtual too. I know we still say, are you on mute or can you see my screen? So it's something we're all still working through. So that change is not over either. So I think you both bring up great points about how we'll start to see more of what the effects were as we kind of get further and further away from the beginning of this pandemic. The other topic I really want to discuss and distinguish is between behavioral health and mental health. Mark, I'll have you take this question. Can you give us a general overview of the difference between the two, if there are a difference, just so our viewers can kind of understand when we use those two different terms? Yeah, I think that's a really important uh, distinction. So we define behavioral health as uh, mental health plus substance use disorder treatment. So it, it encompasses both. Uh, they get used interchangeably a lot. And, and frankly, there's nothing that's that, nothing wrong with that. But technically, uh, the definition is that behavioral health includes both mental health as well as substance use disorder treatment. And how does Intermountain approach behavioral and mental health? You're the behavioral health services yeah. director. Can you kind of explain how that works within a healthcare system? Well, we feel very strongly that we need to meet patients where they come in. And people will come to us at, at, all, at all levels um, along a spectrum of care. So we have educational resources the, further up, the furthest upstream. 
We have our primary care clinics where people can come in and uh, where we screen for depression and anxiety with their primary care. We have um, our behavioral health specialty clinics where we see more of our um, severely ill uh, people who have behavioral health problems. And then we have our, our um, inpatient services and our crisis. So, so our goal really is to have services along this entire spectrum and meet people where they are when they come in to see us. And have you seen an increase of people trying to access resources in the last little bit as you've kind of opened back up a little bit more? Has there been a need for more of these resources than in the past? Yes, there definitely has. We, we, we feel that distress that's out in the community. And as I said earlier, it's that kind of post-disaster time where we begin to see the effects. And I think we're on the leading edge of that wave, but we're definitely seeing you know, more calls to our, um, our outpatient clinics. We're seeing the, what we hear from our primary care doctors is what they're talking about with their patients are behavioral health topics. Um, which is interesting. We see, you know, we've, we can talk a little bit more about some of our other services, but we've started a, uh, an entirely virtual clinic called uh, Connect Care Behavioral Health, who are seeing, you know, large number of new patients. So yes, there, there's, uh, there's the distress in the community, which is translating into increased visits in all of our services. You mentioned Connect Care. The other thing I want to talk about is our behavioral health navigation line. It was called the Emotional Health Relief Hotline. So if anyone's watching, used to hear me give that phone number out. They transitioned a little bit more to be specifically around behavioral health. Can you explain what this navigation line is and why it was created? Yes, well, thank you. That was so we don't like change, but change gives us an opportunity to really make some big changes and to steps forward in our, in our world. So we had been talking about having a, this umbrella service, a digital, a digital access center um, for a long time, um, but it was really hard to get it off the ground. When the pandemic hit last March, we saw an opportunity. And within a couple of weeks, we were able to start this emotional health relief hotline, which was meant as a, as a quick call for, for anybody, frankly, our, our community members our, or our caregivers at Intermountain, they could call and have someone to talk with. And we set up uh, some of our redeployed caregivers to be able to answer the phone. So that was something that was an opportunity that we seized. Um, as the year went on, it became clear that we could do something more with that. And so just on April 1st, we transformed the Emotional Health Relief Hotline into our Behavioral Health Services Navigation Line. And that is a, a, a one call does it all for behavioral health at Intermountain. We know that getting an appointment or getting uh, hooked up for services at Intermountain, uh, any, anywhere in behavioral health is difficult. People don't know who to call or what to do. They begin to realize, hey, I need some help. But then the next step is, well, what do I do? Well, I would get calls and I'm sure Rob would get calls and our, you know, our, friend, our uh, other docs and, and uh, behavioral health providers would get calls. But gosh, if you didn't know somebody to call, you kind of had to just suffer in silence or you know, get on the internet and look up something. So we wanted a place where people in the community would know the number and could call and they would talk to a body who could then help them better understand where they, what kind of services they might need. So we're really excited that that is up and running. It's in its early phases. Uh, we are doing some basic triage when people call to, you know, again, to help understand what they might need. And that may go anywhere from, hey, here's some educational material you might want to look at. Um, here's, a, here's a behavioral health app that we can recommend that you look at to scheduling with our outpatient providers or, hey, this sounds like a crisis. It's we need, you need to get to the hospitals or somebody there who can get you there. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're providing right now. 
as we move into our next phases, we will have um, social workers and other clinicians there who are gonna do, be able to do even more uh, specialized referral into just the right service for you. So that's how we're going to build it. But the basic approach is, hey, if you have an issue, we want you to call now before this gets worse and we'll help you to find what's best for you. And do you know how many people the line has served since its inception? Well, it's just been open now, what, we're about seven weeks. I don't have a, I don't have a count on it, um, but I know that we are, we have capacity and it's one of the reasons we're here today is to let people know about it. So we are getting a good number of calls, but we're ready to have more. And just so everyone has that number now, I'll give it a few times, but it is 833-442-2211. Rob, I'm going to switch some time, some questions over to you and focus a little bit more on NAMI. Can you tell us exactly what your role is at NAMI and what you do for them? So I'm the executive director here at NAMI Utah. So we're one of the state chapters of the national organization, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. There are chapters in all 50 states and there are actually affiliate offices, almost 300 affiliate offices around the country. And, and really what our role is in, in mental health is we're a grassroots mental health organization founded about 40 years ago, really by parents who were really struggling with accessing mental health services for their kids, basically. And um, what it's grown into is advocacy, um, education, as Dr. Foote talked about, sometimes when you're just starting out and you're just realizing that something's happening, education is really what you need. What am I seeing? What, what should I do at this point? Um, you know, those kinds of pieces. The other thing that NAMI helps do is provide support groups for folks. So people living with a mental health condition, family members. I mean, one of the things that we hear very often is that people feel very alone. Um, you know, you don't quite know what's happening within your family because really we are the experts with our families. And when we see something we don't really know, we kind of don't think that anyone else is going through this. But if you think about it, I mean, about one in five individuals is diagnosed with a mental health condition. Well, there are four or five people around that person. So it really does affect all of us when, you know, we talk to people all the time and I've never heard someone say, nope, I've never had an experience with mental health conditions. And so what we try and do, and, and I have to say, it's, it's encouraging that, um, it's not encouraging, it's, it's enlightening that we all kind of don't know where to start. You know what I mean? Like we get phone calls too, and, and we do much the same thing in terms of talking through issues with folks. We help them navigate maybe their own personal insurance, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there are a lot of folks out there that kind of don't know where to start. So anytime we hear of additional resources that give people that, that way into mental health services, it's very encouraging. So we are, we're very encouraged by the work that Intermountain is doing. Um, and, and, you know, we, I think we're gonna talk in a little bit about the stigma piece um, but that all of that helps decrease that stigma. You mentioned some of the resources that NAMI provides. How do people access those resources? I know you guys have a website, but is there mm -hmm. a, a better way for people to access those or the easiest route for people to actually contact you? You know, I will say that the that our website, namiut.org, is the easiest way because with each class or support group or whatever, there is a link right there in the description that you can go and register for those. I mentioned earlier that we have transitioned all of our in-person offerings to the virtual space and we do education classes and support groups multiple times a week. So there are various schedules that hopefully meet people's needs. And I have to say, it's been very interesting that we worried that the, the lack of an in-person connection would be very off-putting to many individuals. And while we have heard a few that have said that, what we've also found is we've expanded our reach tremendously. People in rural communities now can attend a support group. They don't have to drive hundreds of miles or whatever. We also have situations where families 
who maybe aren't all in Utah can connect in a support group all together. So we had a family, the parents are in Minnesota and the children are here and they were able to join together. So, I mean, there's been some pieces of this that have, you know, expanded the reach and we're, we're pretty excited about that. I love the idea that these virtual events can bring people together in ways that maybe we couldn't before. So that's really great to hear that it's working. And I, I love that it's, it gives people the ability to kind of be flexible with their schedule. They don't show up to an appointment exactly at 3 p.m. or something yeah. like that. It can be more of when they need the actual support, it's available for them through this or the phone number I gave previously. So it's great to hear that there's options for people. I wanna ask you, both of you, this question. Do you ever work together in your organizations, Mark? Do you ever work with Rob with any projects that are going on? Or how does the community side with NAMI kind of interact with the hospitals? Rob, I'll start with you and then Mark, I'll ask you. Yeah, so we, we mentioned earlier, I mean, there's this kind of overall approach to mental health in the community. And we, many of us are involved with county efforts, statewide efforts, et cetera. And I think what ends up happening is we, we focus on what we're very good at. And obviously we're, we're different organizations in terms of you know, a grassroots nonprofit organization um, that really wants to make sure that we reach um, people experiencing serious mental health conditions, their families to provide that support. And we're really a volunteer organization so when we provide a support group, it's being led by volunteers who have experienced what it is that they're talking about in the support group. And it's one of those things. And what we like to say is that it really augments virtually every level of treatment, as Dr. Foote was talking about before, that continuum of services um, from information to inpatient interventions. And, and we like to think that that NAMI and the volunteer group can help support and help individuals, you know, get the most out of those clinical interventions. And so, um, you know, as we mentioned, we, we, we interact periodically at some of the planning meetings and such, um, but I think we really find our niche in terms of how do we help support the good work that's already going on in the community. And Mark, would you like to add anything on that as well? Yes, uh, definitely. So Intermountain is definitely, definitely committed to all of our communities across Utah and even in Southern Idaho and, and into Nevada. Uh, that is a huge piece of what we do. Um, we are uh, involved with uh, the different committees from the legislature, uh, the Crisis Commission right now, where we're talking about setting up uh, receiving centers for receiving centers across the state. So we're involved with those things. We're also involved with great organizations like NAMI um, and many others. Uh, Intermountain uh, contributes to, to many grassroots organizations. So um, we feel like, you know, we're really, our mission is to help people live, live the healthiest lives possible. And, and we're a mission-driven organization. So we definitely want to be involved in, in the things that we can, and especially around behavioral health, because we know that our communities are asking about that. Whenever we do any type of large scale surveys, what, what comes up that the that people want help with are the behavioral health issues. So it's been interesting that that, that then that comes, it becomes a driver for Intermountain to be, to be involved in those things the community wants and, and mental health and behavioral health is clearly one of those. I wanna talk a little bit about stigma. Robbie mentioned this earlier, but Mark, we'll start with you. How do you help people in your everyday life address the stigma related to mental health, whether that's professionally or in personal? Yeah. Stigma is, our, I think, our toughest issue. And, I, and I'm gonna bet that Rob agrees. We can lay out arguments that are logical, that are historical, that are, operational that are financial and that you know it says treating behavioral health problems is good for the person who's suffering from them and it's good for overall costs and it, it it's still it's a hard sell and it always has been this is centuries old so when it comes to people every day what can we do i mean we talk about it Here's an example. We have organizations like 
NAMI who have been, you know, decades long partners in trying to break down the stigma. We can work in our primary care clinics, again, where people go to make uh, behavioral health and mental health care a normal part of, of their, the screening process, a normal part of your discussion with your doctor. So I think we just have to keep talking about it. And frankly, it has improved in the 27 years that I've been in practice. You know, when I started, you know, if, if, if it came up in primary care that someone was struggling, well, the, the doctor would immediately refer the patient to me. Um, you know, they didn't want to deal with behavioral health stuff. Now our primary care doctors, it's a routine part of, of the every visit and they discuss it and, and, and it, it, it's normalized because, you know, it, it is just part of our, of our human condition and, and we're here to, as healthcare providers to provide care for what people need. So it's ongoing work, it's hard work, but it's work that we can do. And Rob, do you have any additional thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I just want to second that um, it is definitely part of the human condition. And as I mentioned before, I, I really genuinely have never had a conversation with someone that didn't have some connection to mental illness, mental health conditions, et cetera. And I completely agree that simply talking about it um, is really how we break that stigma. What could, because when we talk about it, we realize, oh gosh, I've experienced some of that similar, some of those similar things. And I would also say that um, it is getting better. And when we think about things like legislatively, um, each year over the last few years, there's been more and more discussion, more and more bills being proposed around improving mental health access, et cetera. One thing we're really looking forward to is the development of the of the um, crisis line number, the 988 number, a specific number that you call for a mental health crisis rather than a law enforcement response. Now you're gonna get a, a mental health response and I'm, we're, we're just overjoyed that that's gonna take place. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard work and we, you know, we bump into stigma, but I totally agree it's getting better. That number will be a great resource. I'm excited to see what happens with that. Rob or Dr. Foote, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to leave us with before we take off for the day? Rob, I'll start with you. You know, what I would say is um, it's, been, it's been an unusual year. Let's just put it that way. And so what we, what we like to say to people is, you know, you're not alone, but often we do feel alone. And I know for me, when I feel not very good. The last thing I want to do is reach out to people, unfortunately. And so what we are encouraging folks to do is to make deliberate efforts to reach out to people that you think maybe aren't doing so well right now. Because, you know, as Dr. Foote mentioned, now we're at the end of this piece where all of a sudden, you know, now what do we do? The crisis, the crisis is over, but now what, what do we do to emerge from this? And so we really encourage folks, reach out, ask someone how they're doing. You don't have to resolve their mental health condition, but just asking how they're doing can be hugely helpful in terms of, you know, getting someone on the road to good mental health. And so I would say, um, reach out, it, it will make a difference. That's great advice. And I definitely agree. Uh, Dr. Foote, is there anything you'd like to mention? Yes, um, as I've said, you know, this is the end of the, the pandemic and we've all been holding in a lot, of, a lot of stress and we've all put our head down and, and you know, take that next step. Um, I think we all need to recognize that we may see a little bit of a letdown phenomenon uh, after putting in so much energy to getting by. So I would say, you know, start with your, your circles of control, starting with yourself. Um, limit the sources of stress. You know, if you've been hooked on the, the TV or, or your screen time, you know, try to get away from that and, and have, you know, limit that. Instead, break the isolation and go out and spend time with family, with friends, with your hobbies and interests. Um, get away from that isolation that has been part of our survival. Um, you know, get back into your usual rhythms 
get that exercise. And, you know, that's been hard being home. It's been different, but to get back into a normal sleep wake cycle and, and exercise routine and meal times and those types of things. Um, and finally, if you're having some problems that you're concerned about, reach out to others, talk about it. And if you really need to reach out to NAMI, reach out to, um, to Intermountain, reach out to your primary care doctor, you know, reach out to, to a professional for help. Don't hesitate because it, it honestly, it's like any other problem that you, the sooner you get after it, uh, the sooner you can treat it and, and move forward. So keep, your, keep yourself in the center uh, of that, those circles and take care of yourself and then keep a close eye out for your family, friends, coworkers as you kind of move out uh, in your circle. Um, we will get through this. Uh, it has been, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a once in a lifetime experience for us, hopefully, and um, we'll move back into uh, our new normal soon. Well, thank you both for joining us. And I definitely feel the waking up at a normal time and having a normal schedule. It gets a little bit hard when you're working from home or when your schedule is a little bit different than it used to be. So I appreciate the advice that you both provided. And really quickly, before we take off, I'll just give those resources one more time for people watching. Our Behavioral Health Navigation Line phone number is 833-442-2211. And NAMI's website is namiut.org. Thank you both again for joining us and we'll talk to you later. Have a good day.